Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the next webinar in our series in, as part of the Charming Forest Species Identification and Recording uh, Project. This is number seven in the series, which is an introduction to species recording skills. Just a quick bit of housekeeping before we crack on. Um, so as ever, uh, we are recording the session um, so it can go up on YouTube and people can pick it up at a later date if they weren't able to make it today. So if you could keep your microphones off, that'd be great until um, we get to the questions at the end, then obviously feel free to pop them back on. It's completely up to you whether you have your cameras on or off. Um, we will make sure there's time for questions and answers at the end. If you've got anything, pop it in the chat as you think about it um, or save it for the end uh, and we can, we can cover that at the end of the session. As ever, we're looking for um, approximately a uh, two o'clock-ish finish and hopefully uh, a nice a little lunchtime introduction to species recording skills. So I'm really pleased today that we've got a special guest speaker, um, which is Dave Nichols, who is the founder and current manager of NatureSpot, which if you haven't come across it yet, um, do take a look after today's webinar. Um, it's a fantastic resource, loads of information about species, about special places across the county, and it's where we'll be starting to collate some of the records um, that might come through as a result of this project. So do take a look. Dave is also the county recorder for mollusks and sawflies, um, but he very much considers himself uh, an all-round naturalist rather than a specialist. So thank you so much, Dave, for uh, agreeing to join us today. Um, really looking forward to this. Uh, and without further ado, I'm going to stop my share uh, and hand the reins over to you. Hey, lovely. Thanks, Claire. Um, welcome to everybody. There's uh, one or two familiar names in the list, so uh, special hi to you. Um, as Claire said, uh, if you've not visited Nature Spot before, then I hope perhaps after the prompt of today, you, you'll have a look. It's, um, Nature Spot is a charity that specialises in the wildlife of Leicestershire and Rotland. So it's uh, very much a, a local affair. And as we'll uh, run through some of the features on it, I think you'll find it uh, really useful for, for your general interest in wildlife. But specifically, it is the uh, portal for recording wildlife sightings in Leicestershire and Rotland. And so as part of the, the, the channel project, obviously we hope you, you'll kind of engage and, and start sub submitting some records. So to get going, I'm going to share my screen. Um, so I know some of you will be familiar with Next Spot. So, uh, and others will be new to it. So I'm going to try and you know make sure there's something of interest for wherever you are on, on that journey. And at the end, uh, as Kai said, you'll have a chance to ask some questions. So one of the kind of basic questions is kind of why why record at all? Um, a lot of people keep their own lists and so on, but don't necessarily share the sightings that they see. So I think perhaps the most important thing to stress is that these records do contribute to our scientific knowledge and ultimately to conservation, because without knowing what's out there, um, how can you take the right uh, management decisions? But from a personal point of view, equally, it's, it's important as well. You know, it's, a, it's an opportunity and an excuse, if you like, to, to spend time outside. And I, I guess all of us wouldn't be here if we didn't enjoy seeing wildlife. So by getting out and about, and I think the, the discipline of, of recording means that you have to look more closely. It does actually enable you to discover more and therefore enjoy more wildlife. And as part of this whole process, you will learn more about the natural world. I always think it's really important to be able to put a name to a species if you want to learn about wildlife. You need a kind of a peg to hang your knowledge on. If it's just a beetle, then how do you know how that beetle is different from the next beetle. And every single species has its unique uh, life story to tell. And it's fascinating, but you need to be able to separate one from another to, to develop that knowledge. So knowledge is key, as I've said, um, but interestingly and worryingly perhaps, the majority of species um, are data deficient. I, we don't really know what's out there and well, if we do know it's out there, we don't know where it is or what its status is. Is it rare? Is it common? Is it becoming more rare? And it's only by kind of getting many people recording that we're really able to get a handle on this. And it's interesting that 
even common species uh, are often not recorded and therefore poorly understood. So I think one of the kind of first lessons of recording is don't just wait until you see something notable or something you think is rare. Uh, try and get into the habit of, of recording a whole range of species, even the common ones. You don't have to necessarily record the same species on the same site every day. As a general rule, we say just record it once a year from a given site. But do record the, the common species as well as the, the more notable ones. And you know, as I've said, uh, having got good data, it can have quite a big um, benefit to conservation and, and in many cases can protect sites from development. So I imagine all of you are actually from Leicestershire and Rutland or at least anticipate contributing to the channel project by visiting. And, and therefore, uh, you will be hopefully recording through Nature Spot. Uh, we only take records from Leicestershire and Rutland, uh, but we're part of the national iRecord family. iRecord is the national wildlife recording website. So if you're outside Leicestershire or if you want to go on a holiday somewhere elsewhere in the UK and want to um, record what you've seen there, then you would do that not through Nature Spot, but through iRecord. So, uh, as I mentioned right at the beginning, uh, we are uh, a charity. We, we started life about 12 years ago, uh, and we have three main aims. The first of all is to help the public identify local wildlife and, and to learn more about our, our environment. Um, and secondly, to kind of showcase the wildlife and the wild places that are around us. And then thirdly, to, to help more people to get into wildlife recording. So I think at this point, I'm going to try and come out of my sharing um, of this presentation and try and go live onto the NetSport website. Um, there's a slight gamble with doing this because it depends on the, um, on the internet connection as to how well it works. But hopefully you can all see uh, the home page now. Um, I think part of the beauty of, of, of NetSport is that it changes so much virtually every day you, well every hour sometimes you look at it there are different things to see and that's because the way it's built is that it uh, gathers all of the latest record data and the latest images and displays them so for example this image on the on the home page here of the springtail uh, that's only recently appeared uh, today the news stories change all the time uh, we have an events listing down here um, so there's there's plenty to to look at. Um, we have a, a forum on the site uh, and this latest chat gives a, a quick pointer to what's the latest submissions there. And we'll come back to that because that's something that you might want to use to, to help you with identification. I think the starting point for most people are these image galleries. Um, what we, we try to do is to provide a, an illustrated gallery of every species that is known in Leicestershire and Rutland. We haven't finished that job yet, there's more to come, but we're currently over 7,000, and that number increases virtually daily as more people uh, submit records of what they've seen. We keep discovering um, or finding you know, species that either are new to the county or haven't been seen for a while. I'd like to think that by now we've probably covered uh, nearly all of the species that you're likely to see. And the beauty is, as we'll look at in the tick, that uh, it's only looking at local species. So unlike a national guidebook where you'll have specialist species from coasts, from mountains and so on, which can make identification difficult because you're looking at species that you'll never find in Leicestershire and Rutland, then um, it's a much narrower, more focused uh, look. So um, let's just have a, a quick look at one or two of these galleries. So I'll just start with birds. So you just literally click on the link and it should load the gallery for, for birds. And you can do the same, obviously, for any of these other groups. And what we, we aim to do is make sure we've got a, a gallery photo that typically illustrates that species. For some species, um, we will put more than one image up, um, where the differences of males and females, sometimes um, juveniles are different, obviously, with some insects, they're, they're very different. You, know, you can have caterpillars and butterflies, for example. Um, and some species also show a lot of variation. And we'll have a look at some of the beetles that do that in a minute. So you'll see, um, we, we're just trying to make it easy for you to spot 
uh, whatever species you've found. So if you found a bird and you're not sure what it is, uh, this is a great place to start. You can just scroll through here and hopefully you'll see um, something that looks similar. Uh, now, the, these colored icons here um, are very much a pointer to how easy it is to identify that species. It uses a kind of traffic light system, uh, green, amber, and red. So green means it's pretty straightforward to identify. You're not likely to confuse it with anything else. Most birds fall into this category. That's not to say that there aren't other similar species. You can see straight away here, there are other greens in the family and you just got to look carefully, but they're sufficiently distinctive that uh, at least with a photo, you should have little problem in, in, in working out what it is. So you think it's a great crested reed, let's say, you can then just click on that uh, image and it will open the page for that species. So let's have a quick look at what it's telling us. So there's a, a description, um, some are more detailed than others. And what we aim to do, and this is, this is a very much a work in progress, is to provide sufficient description that will allow you to identify it and distinguish it from other species. On some, particularly some of the invertebrates, there are other categories which we've gone into that kind of list some of the key identification features. But, you know, birds are pretty easy, relatively. And, and as we said, this is a, a green rated species gives you a little note as to where you might find it, when to see it, sometimes some interesting facts about its life history. And then interestingly, um, some comments about its status, both across the UK as a whole and its local status. Now you'll see references to this little bit of jargon called VC55. Uh, this stands for Vice County 55. And what it is, it's um, the standard recording boundary for Leicestershire and Rutland. What happens over time is uh, politics gets in the way of recording by changing the boundaries. Uh, for example, Rutland in the past has been part of Leicestershire, then it was split off and then it was combined again and now it's separate again. So if you were recording um, and trying to keep within the political boundaries, you know, literally the goalposts are moving all the time. So. Uh, these vice counties are permanently set boundaries based on what the boundaries were at some time in the past. Um, but just as a, as a very broad uh, rule of thumb, uh, vice county 55 equals Leicestershire and Rutland. So just carrying on down the page, here we've got a gallery of different images, more so obviously than on the main gallery page. Um, there is a second page um, called additional images here, if you want to see even more. And that can be useful, uh, particularly with, with var varying species, but we'll, we'll just move on from that now. Here you've got also a juvenile uh, on view. Juveniles look very different to the adults with this um, kind of Dalmatian-like neck and head. And then at the bottom, uh, we've got a couple of ma uh, maps. Um, the one on the left shows the outline of Leicestershire and Rutland, the one on the right, clearly the UK. Now, the data here is a combination of data from NatureSpot and data from the National Biodiversity Network, which is the, the national body that collects all records from across the UK. Um, if you've never been on the MBN Atlas website, it's, uh, it's worth a look. You can get to it from the link at the bottom here. Um, but just as a quick summary, this is really useful. Uh, the colors uh, tell you how recent the record is. So the red uh, dots on both maps are records that have been submitted since uh, 2020, so a little over a year old. And then the, the blue records go further back. On the left-hand map, the yellow squares represent records not uh, from NatureSpot, but from the MBN. So in many cases, the, the, you'll see there is a square overlapping with a nature spot dot, and that's because all of our data goes onto the NBN. So obviously then it, um, it, it shows on the NBN website as a record showing its presence in that, in that area. I think these squares represent two kilometer squares. Uh, so you kind of get an idea that even a common bird like um, the Great Crested Grebe, there are probably plenty of other waterways 
in uh, the two counties where it could be found that's not necessarily recorded. This is more obvious with a terrestrial species that could literally be found anywhere. So um, just perhaps one other thing, I'll just go back um, onto the, the main gallery page. If you are familiar with the family, some of these uh, groups are, are quite long, particularly if you go to something like um, uh, like beetles, in fact, let's do that. Let's go to, to beetles and, and bring that up. Uh, it goes on for many, many pages and it could take you a while to scroll through. You might know, for example, that you found a ladybird. So if you look at the side of this beetle entry on the menu, yeah, there's a little arrow. If you click on that, you now get a drop down of all of the families within the beetles. So um, it does require in some cases you need to know the family, but you may know that. Uh, where we can, uh, we've added common names as well. So here's the one for ladybird. So let's select that. And it's basically, it's just a shortcut that will take you to the ladybird section. So similar layout to the one we saw for birds. A difference here that you may notice straight away is that the two spot ladybird, the first entry on this list has four pictures. And you look at those and you may think uh, they are not showing the same species. This one here, the red one with the two big black dots is the conventional form, the one you're most likely to find, but there are other variants. And the same with the next one on the list, the ten. Got the ladybirds back. That's brilliant. <laughs> I will mute myself and we'll, we'll crack on. Thank you for your patience, everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Apologies again. So, yes, I was just explaining uh, before we were rudely interrupted um, about the variation you see in some species, such as the two spot ladybird at the top and the, and the ten spot and the harlequin below. And so, just really. Um, a note of caution, um, just to be that little bit careful in, in your identification, even with species that you might have previously thought were, were very easy to do, ladybirds. I mean, who would have known, for example, that there are 70 different ladybird species in the UK? So, you know, quite, and, and then if you add in the variations as well, uh, you've got a fair few to get, to get going with. So we, we'll move on in a minute just to recording. Uh, just a few other things I wanted to mention um, about NatureSpot that you will hopefully find of interest. I'm just gonna go back to the home page, And um, we have a feature on NatureSpot where we can effectively draw a boundary around a given uh, place or location, and it can will automatically list all of the images and the records for that location. And uh, so if it's a site, then we call them wild places and there's a drop down menu here on the home page. And you can see there's a long list, there's a few hundred. Now we have created one for um, the Chanwood Forest Regional Park. Um, and so if you were wondering about the boundary, um, for example, when you come to record, are you in or outside the boundary? You can uh, come and have a look at it here. And a little bit of information and some 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 links to other uh, sites. I think over time, uh, Claire and myself will, will try and add more to this. But uh, you can see um, these are some of the latest images submitted from within that boundary, and then list of some of the, the the records below. So if you submit a record for um, that that the, the, is a sighting within that boundary, it will appear on this list. And you could scroll through and find it. And the similar functionality works with the parishes. We have set up parish pages for many of the parishes in Leicestershire uh, particularly. Um, and it just adds a quite a local uh, feel to what's going on. Um, some of the parish parishes are really well supported. And it helps encourage people to, to record, for example, in their gardens, as well as local uh, parks and other green spaces. Um, just before we move on, I'll just mention that there are two main menus. Now you're seeing a slightly different screen on my share to that which you will on your own because I'm an administrator on NatureSpot, so I get additional functionality. Um, but this menu here shows all the main links. 
um, to the kind of common pages. And then this menu at the top, uh, you may want to, to look at on occasions, and particularly this one where it says identification recording. If you click on it, you get a drop down. And the one I'd draw your attention to is the one that says ID resources. So if you click on that, you get a page menu there of, um, the, the, there's a page for each of these groups that will then give you a list of books and other websites and other help in getting ID uh, resources um, or ID help really for whatever you've found. So at this point, I'm gonna go back to my slides. Um, So where do you, if, I, I appreciate for some of you, um, you've, you've gone past this point, but for those of you who are relatively new to recording, um, it can seem a bit overwhelming. I've already kind of given you a hint of the massive range of species. There are 7,000 that are already covered on next spot. Where do you start? And so I'd, I'd recommend that you, uh, you, you start with one or two groups. You know, you might choose birds or, or wildflowers. And actually this is a good time of year to get started because you're not going to be overwhelmed uh, by either flowers or, or insects, for example. And as time goes on and the weather improves, you'll slowly start to see more species. And I would strongly recommend you try and learn the commonest species first, not least because trying to remember these is a matter of repetition and, and refinding and, and reminding yourself. And the common ones you're going to come across all the time and it will just help to uh, to remind you of what you've seen. Um, you must take photos if you can. That's, a, that's the probably number one rule, and we'll come back to this in a minute. And to and use those uh, RAG uh, identification uh, difficulty ratings on NatureSpot to give you an idea, and go for the easy to identify species. You, you probably get a bit frustrated if you try to identify something that requires um, you to use a key if you're not familiar with keys. And so go for the green rated ones. There's plenty to choose from, so you won't be short of species to record. And just a reminder of those green uh, rate, those rag ratings, sorry. Yeah, green uh, means it's relatively easy to identify and you, you should be okay to, to record that. Amber is still okay, but just take some care because what we're saying is there are other similar species that you could confuse it with if you're not careful. But particularly if you use perhaps the NatureSpot uh, species page, it should tell you how to distinguish it from a similar species. Um, the red species are challenging and normally a photo isn't good enough to, to confirm it is that species. You often need the specimen. Um, and the photograph could be good enough if it's a really detailed picture and it, and it shows the key features. And it means that there were one or more very similar species out there. So let's just look in a little bit more detail at photos. Um, although for some common species, um, particularly some of the birds, which can be difficult to photograph, it's generally okay uh, to record them without a, a photo. But if you can, try and take a picture, particularly if you're new to recording, um, because we need to know that you've, you've identified that species correctly. So we need evidence. A photo is the best evidence that you can submit with your record. But also it helps you. Um, if you've got a photograph and you're not quite sure what it is, you've got something to compare to, to other pictures. Uh, you've got something uh, that you could email uh, to, a, to a friend or possibly post on a forum and get some ID help. Um, it also avoids you taking a specimen, uh, which a lot of people wish to avoid. And also over time, you'll kind of create your own library, uh, which can be really useful in looking back uh, at what you've seen and building up a range of, of, of pictures of uh, a species that you've seen and you can compare them over time. Um, I'm often asked, you know, which camera should I use? I mean, if, if you are a keen recorder, um, you might spend a bit on a good camera but you don't have to. I think that is something that, that is important to stress. A lot of people take really good pictures with very cheap cameras. 
Um, what you're particularly looking for is something that can take a macro shot. That is a kind of a close up because a lot of the time British wildlife is small and you need to be able to pick out the details. Um, can you use a mobile camera, um, a, a mobile phone camera? You can. Uh, they're not great often, but they can be used. Um, I'll just say be careful with the focusing, but most mobiles will have an autofocus. But if you're trying to take a picture of, um, I don't know, let's say a flower or a butterfly, it may well focus on the background and not on the animal or the plant. So um, one way to do that, it, particularly with a plant, you can put your hand alongside the flower and then try and focus on, on the flower. Some mobiles allow you to adjust the focus. Uh, we do get quite a few pictures sent to us with very kind of blurry images, which as you can appreciate, isn't that helpful. So if you want to kind of over time get into it, I'd suggest you perhaps try and carry a, 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 another portable camera with you. In terms of technique, um, it's not so much of a problem if you're taking a picture of something that's not going to fly or run away, uh, like a plant, but uh, what happens if it's a butterfly or a beetle or something? How do you get close enough to take a good picture? Do you, do you zoom uh, in or, or do you just kind of creep up to it? And well, both would work. Uh, zooming is great if you've got that zoom function on your camera. If not, then, then actually it can be quite fun to see how close you can get. Um, and just be persistent and patient because often it will fly away, but often then land again nearby. So if you just move very slowly, uh, it's surprising how close you can get. With digital images, there's no cost to taking lots of pictures. So do that. It's amazing. If you take six pictures, one after another, with the same settings, you'll find that they're not the same and that one or two of them will be sharper than the others or the the, the creatures move slightly. Um, and the second point here is to take lots of angles, try and um, get it from top, bottom, side, and so on, because you'd be surprised how crucial those different angles are to trying to identify something. So, I mean, just to illustrate, um, I've shown some pictures here of, um, of snails and slugs. Um, there are often four key features with a snail that all can be crucial for identification. Um, the overall shape of it, um, you know, is it, is it round, is it pointed? How pointy is the pointed bit, for example? You know, its profile, um, the mouth, um, where, where the body of the snail sticks out, the shape of that and how that mouth attaches to the shell uh, is important. The umbilicus is the hole that goes right through the center. It's like the coil that all of the, the shell wraps around. Some uh, the snails have bigger or smaller ones. In some cases, they're partly obscured by, by the lip. And, and then, uh, secondly, kind of a, a, a shot that shows the, the apex of the snail. You can then see the pattern. Sometimes you need to count the number of whorls or the, 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 the pattern can be quite crucial. Now, with slugs, it's very different. Of course, there's no shell. But did you know that snail, uh, sorry, slugs always prefer to have their photograph taken on their right hand side. That's their best look. And so try and remember that. And the real reason is that on the right hand side of all slugs is the breathing pore, which you can just see here on this picture. And that is another crucial ID feature. So always try and take a picture of a, a slug on its right hand side. So a side shot, a top down shot, and also the uh, the, the sole of the slug is important. Some species like the Budapest slug, which is very common, there are actually two similar species. The common one has a dark stripe down its sole and uh, the other one uh, has a more uniform sole. So just do get into the habit of trying to take loads of pictures. Plants can be um, quite tricky too. Some are easy, some less so. And so these uh, other things to bear in mind. So if in doubt, just take as many pictures as, as you can. Um, it's not just a matter of taking a picture of the flower often, uh, the leaves are crucial. And often plants have different types of leaves uh, on the upper stem to those at the base. And the basal leaves are often in a rosette around the ground. And that's sometimes crucial to know. 
Uh, if you're taking a picture of the flower, then take a side on picture because there are features underneath the petals, uh, the stamens, for example, uh, sorry, the, um, the, 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 the sepals that uh, are underneath the petals, uh, they can be crucial. And look inside the flower, the, the shape and number of the, of the stamens uh, and the style are also key. Seed pods or fruits can be, can be uh, key features. And the stem, is it hairy? And if it is hairy, are those, ham, are those hairs glandular or unpressed? Glandular means they've got a little blob of, um, of fluid on the end. Uh, and press means they aren't sticking out. They are pushed down uh, like, a, like a coat of fur, really, against the, the, the stem. Grasses can be tricky, too. Obviously, they look more similar. Um, they have features such as uh, the ligule, which is under is where the leaf comes from the stem. The awns uh, are, in, with, in some species, are the spiky bits that come out of the seeds. These can be critical. And don't forget to take a picture of the whole plant, showing the habitat that it's in. If it's growing you know, out of a wall, for example, that uh, also can be really good evidence. So don't be frightened to take lots of pictures. And when you submit a record, uh, you can submit uh, up to four pictures. So pick the ones that uh, show these different features. So getting on to recording specifically on Nature Sport now, uh, you have to be registered to access the submit records form. And there's a reason for that um, is because there are four bits of key information we need to know uh, for this for any record. Um, uh, and it's not just the Nature Sport, this is the national um, kind of expectation or requirement. We need to know who is submitting the record, when the sighting was made, where it was made, and obviously what the species is. By registering, uh, when you log on, we automatically know who you are and your records will be automatically connected to you. So that just means the form is that little bit easier. Um, you can submit records online on the NatureSpot website, but we also have an app. Um, and that we have, there's a guidance page which you can get to from the website, which will tell you how to download it and, and how to use it. I, I think I mentioned earlier that Nature Sport is part of the National iRecord family. So we use the app that they've developed, which um, allows the records to, uh, with, a, with a slight selection, to connect directly to the Nature Sport website. So I'm going to. Um, come back to uh, the NetSpot website and we'll try going through how to submit a record. Um, a bit easier, I think, than, than just trying to talk about it. So once you're logged in, you'll see a link um, on the main menu called Submit Records. So you click on that and this is the form that you will see. Um, if you're new to it, and you want some help, there's a little video here you can click on and watch. Uh, we have a, a kind of an illustrated guidance page. But the other thing I draw attention to, and it surprises me how many people don't use it, for every single uh, box that you may think you need to fill in, if you just hover on these little blue icons, it gives you a little tip and a summary of explanation. Um, Quite a few of these boxes are optional, so you don't necessarily need to fill them all in. And we'll, we'll just quickly run through that. Now, what we want to do, if you are recording on behalf of the channel project, is to be able to recognize that that record is associated with the project. So the first thing you would do is select the Charnwood Forest uh, option on the project heading. If you're recording from outside of the Charnwood Forest area, don't select this one at all, just skip by it. This overall comment box, as the tip tells you, is also optional. This is a comment that you could put down that would be attached to every single record you might put on the sheet. And um, there's a, another option later down to put a specific comment related to each species. But if you put one in here, it would apply to everyone. So it might be that if you're running a moth trap, for example, you might just say um, records from a moth trap uh, running my garden. You might describe the type of moth trap it is, um, but otherwise just leave it blank. So I'm going to um, put in a record um, that I made at uh, Thornton Reservoir last week. 
which was on the 5th of January. So you see straight away, uh, putting the date in is very easy. You just click on the box and it gives you this date picker box and it defaults to today's date, but you can put any date in. You can go back through time. You can put records in from last year, if you like. So I'm clicking the, the date from, from last week. Um, now the site name, uh, it was Thornton Reservoir. Now I think my browser will remember that I've submitted records from Thornton Reservoir before. Um, this is obviously not going to come up for you unless you over time are using the same uh, sites but for multiple records, but it does make it a little bit easier. But you just type in the name of the record of the site. If you are recording a site that doesn't have a recognizable name, however, always try and start with the, the town or the village that you're in. So uh, if you want to put record in from your garden and you live, well, I live in Ratby, so it would be Ratby Garden. That's all I need to put. Uh, I don't need to put my address down, just we know it's a garden in Ratby. Um, and likewise, obviously for you. Now the crucial bit when it comes to location is not what you call it, because people call sites different things, is the grid reference. And this is the number one barrier that puts people off recording. However, do not fear, because it's actually very easy uh, on the NetSpot website. We have this Google map here, which will work out the grid reference for you. So I could, it's just a Google map, so I could zoom in and find Thornton Reservoir. Um, or a tip is to use this search box. So I'll just put in Thornton Reservoir again, see I've used it before, and then press search. And Google will look for all the Thornton Reservoirs it can find and give you a list of them here. It's only found one in this case, so I click on it and it immediately zooms in to Thornton Reservoir. And I think, ah, yes, well, I know where I saw uh, this bird. It was a gull and it was just by the car park. So I click on there and you'll see the grid reference, as if by magic, has appeared in there. Now, this is a six figure grid reference or six numbers. And that represents a hundred meter square. And for nearly all recording, that is sufficient. If I zoomed out far enough, you see at this point, the little orange square has changed um, and now it's a kilometer square and it's put a, the reference for that kilometer square in here. But a kilometer square isn't really good enough for most records. It's too big, too vague. So always aim for a six figure number. And so let's go back, just re-click it. And there it's put it back in again. You can go the other way if I zoomed in further. Eventually it will, um, you see now it's picking a, a 10 meter square. So so again, change the grid reference. So it's very easy. Um, you don't normally need to go into this level of detail. Um, once you've done it once or twice, you can get very quick at doing it. And now it comes to entering the species. Now this uh, is a, a menu based entry. So you start, it looks like there's nothing there, but you start typing and the options will appear. So the, the bird I'm gonna record was a black headed gull. So I'll start typing. Black. So immediately I've put in black, it's starting to list everything that starts with black. Um, and I just keep typing to reduce the list. So it's already down there, as you can see. And eventually if I put enough letters in, it'll be the only one. I don't need to wait that long. If I can see it, I can just click on it. Make sure you always click on the option. Don't try and type it in. The reason for that is uh, if you make a spelling error, then the computer won't recognize it, at least by picking it from the list, um, it standardizes everybody's entry, entries. And that could be all I need to do uh, if I didn't have a photo. Um, all of the other options along this row are optional. And if you need any reminders or help, again, just look at the, these, these little blue icons. So this is the abundance. Um, actually, there was there were several of them. I think uh, there was about twenty. 
um, or being fed. How confident am I? Well, I was certain, but if you're not, you could you could change that. That's sometimes useful when somebody's checking the record to know how certain you were. Um, these additional options are for further detail. You don't have to fill them in, but uh, they do provide extra information. Now, crucially, I have got a picture, so I'm going to add an image. So once you put the species name in, this link, add images appears. I'll click on that, and then it opens the image box beneath. I'll click on add a photo, and now it will open up my computer. So I'll go and find the image. I don't need to resize it. Um, I could just click on it. I could do multiple images and select two or three or up to four at the same time and then click open and it will resize the image and load it for me. There you are, it's all done, very easy. And um, there is an option to put a little caption beneath the photo if I wanted, um, but I would advise you not to use that in most cases uh, because it doesn't form part of the record. It's solely uh, just a little note on the image and it, that caption always stays with the image when the, the image appears on the website. So it can be useful if you wanted to say it's a male or a female, but you don't really have to use it. If I wanted to say something specific that would be important to the record. So for example, if I didn't have a photo and I wanted just to kind of prove or provide evidence that it was that, I could say, um, white girl, um, black dot uh, behind the eye. And that would, um, I think, tell the person checking this record that that's a key feature for the black headed girl in winter. That it, you know, I, I, it, I was right in saying it was a black headed girl. And at this stage, I would submit it. Actually, I, I could have carried on. There was a second row there. I could have put in a, a, a further records, providing they were on the same date, on the same site, with the same grid reference. Then I can I can put a long list of records there. If you go into a different site or different part of the site, submit it on a different form. So once you've submitted it, just wait a, a few seconds, and uh, you get this page, which tells me uh, the record has been registered. Uh, it tells me a few other things. There's a link here to the species page, which can be quite useful to go and have a look at. And how many previous records for this species there are in Nature Spot? When I last recorded it, uh, and when Nature Spot last recorded it, and then if I wanted, I can go and submit another record and and keep going. So if I was recording, um, you know, a dozen birds that I saw in that same site, I could all do it in a in in two or three minutes really is probably what it would take so not not long at all so i'm going to stop sharing now and come back again to the presentation and uh, you might be interested to know well what happens when you've submitted a record so the first thing to know is every record is individually checked and it's called a process of verification it's important that we are able to confirm that that species is correctly identified. Remember, this data is forming part of the scientific record. It's going to be used um, to check on status, um, to look at distribution patterns and so on. So it's vital that we're talking about the right species here. So this is why this evidence is, is important. Um, once um, it, it's in there at, at the year end, particularly, we, uh, we, we pull all the data off, it goes into a, a standard format, and then we share it with a, a range of different places. The Leicester and Rutland Record Centre, um, all of the county recorders, these are volunteers that uh, are experts in their field, and they look after the data for their particular group. Um, all of the records, as I mentioned earlier, are sent to the National Biodiversity Network. In fact, that happens on a more regular basis. That happens monthly. And, um, and we also then send them to uh, kind of landowners that have a conservation interest, such as the Wildlife Trust and, uh, and local authorities, so that they can take uh, into account the, the data. And all of the data that we supply is what's referred to as open source. Um, so it can be accessed for the National Biodiversity Network, and it makes it useful for researchers then to do further analysis. 
And interestingly, from your point of view, um, you get a little bit of um, a, a, a feedback in the sense that the if you went to the species page, um, then a dot will be added to that map. You remember the maps we looked at earlier on the species page? Your record will add a dot to that page. So if you put a, a record for something in your garden, you could zoom in uh, on, on that map to, to your to your area and you'll see that there should be a dot over your garden. So um, yeah, we've already looked at these maps here. So um, you, you could, there's also a search box here just at the top of the Western Rotland map, which you can use to, to, to look more closely at a given area. The other thing I just wanted to let you know is that uh, every record that is submitted, whether it's accepted uh, or not, is saved on the database. And you can check every record that you've submitted by going to the dashboard link. So this is, uh, is my dashboard. You'll have your own personal one. It kind of calculates all of the records that you've submitted. And there are tabs, <coughs> excuse me, um, both for my records. Uh, and also it will pull out all of the species that I found. And you can download this data uh, on this summary page here. You can see how many species in each year you've seen in each category. So it's, it's, it's really interesting and useful, particularly if you're a bit nerdy like me and like to see how you're doing. So let me just finish with a few tips on how you might get on with identification. Obviously the whole business of recording relies on you identifying something correctly. Uh, we mentioned right from the beginning, you can use the Nature Spot galleries. Um, I also pointed briefly the ID resources menu for each of those groups. So and as you start to get more involved and want to kind of learn a little bit more, that, that's, a, that's a good pointer signposting place uh, to other resources. If you've got a digital photo, then um, you can post that on the Nature Spot forum or indeed other ID forums, quite a few groups have their own specialists, for example, Facebook pages where you can post an image and there's an experts from all over Britain and indeed wider afield uh, will chip in and, and hopefully help you. You can uh, email the image um, either to Nature or or to an expert that you know of or somebody you think that might be able to help. And uh, you, probably over time, you'll do like the rest of us and you'll build up a little network of people that you can call on for help. Um, increasingly, there are a number of apps out there that help you identify things, and um, they're of mixed benefit. Um, the best one um, I found is one called OBS Identify. It's produced in, in the Netherlands, uh, and it's uh, for wildlife, it's probably the best one. But just comes with a word of warning, it's basically a computer trying to work out what it is you take a photo, so it depends on the quality of your photo, and it can get it horrendously and uh, humorously, humorously incorrect. It could, you know, I've had all sorts of things identified as, you know, as tigers or uh, strange things I've never heard of that you don't find in this country. So if it doesn't know it, it'll have a guess, which isn't always helpful. Um, and just uh, to, re to to make a a, a point that. The realism of recording is that none of us can identify every species. No matter how good you get, you can't identify every species. So just accept it. It's a learning process. Um, and by getting something wrong, you'll actually learn from it. Don't be offended if you put in a record and it's not accepted. Uh, the, re the verifier will probably tell you uh, very briefly why or try and work out for yourself why, why you got it wrong. Um, also beware general wildlife guides. You know, books on the, um, the, 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 the insects of Britain that can be helpful to give you pointers, but they're not reliable to get down to species in many cases, because they only tend to show the common species and they don't show you a full range. There are specialist publications out there if you want to get into it that go into more detail. So perhaps a key lesson is don't guess and just, just accept in some cases you can't submit a record. Um, but I would encourage you uh, to, to give it a go. Um, it's, it's really a, an interest for life. You know, there's the, the, the fantastic thing about learning to identify uh, wildlife is that it's kind of a bottomless pit of interest. 
it's um, a fascination for life, really. And uh, so hopefully we'll welcome you to, to the next spot family and look forward to seeing some records from you in the near future. Thank you. That is fantastic. Thanks so much, Dave. That was really uh, fascinating and really good insight into, um, into recording. Um, who knew that um, slugs have a more photogenic side? <laughs> I certainly didn't. That's absolutely new to me. Um, thank you very much um, on behalf of everybody. Um, that's absolutely brilliant. Now, there was a message in the chat, which um, I can see Linda, but I can also see Linda, you've unmuted. So um, did you want to ask your question? Um, yes, I've got several questions, actually. Um, I um, have um, taken, our, I'm not part of the Charmwood um, uh, project, but um, I live in Rutland and I've taken, I work for the, well, I work, I'm part of the Natural History um, Society, Rutland Nats, and um, I, I've taken on the fungi recorder um, job for, for, the, for our little society. And um, I have um, several, well, I mean, fungi is a very difficult group. So my first question is, if I can't identify a, a fungi, um, is, if I can identify it down to family level, um, is that, you know, like a, myc a mycena or an agaric or something like that, is that sufficient to be able to submit a, 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 um, a record? That's the first question. So, uh, yeah, and, and an, another thing, um, Dave was talking about the, the, um, the uh, insects. So if you, you've got the ladybirds, can you, and you, you think it's, I don't know, a six spot or a harlequin or something, is that sufficient with a photograph to be able to submit a record? You know, you don't actually have to, if you're uncertain, I know that you can put that in, but with fungi, it's such a big group, uh, uh, well, presumably with some obscure, obscure kind of beetle, is it okay if you can just put the family level down? rather than the species. Yeah. And the, oh, sorry, Dave. The other thing is um, there's only, sometimes I put a fungi in and the, it, it doesn't, with the species name, it doesn't recognize, you know, I can't find the species name on that, on that box. So that's my other problem. So I have to put unknown fungi. And then of course you, you need to identify the species before you can add a photo. Okay, let, let me try and pick those off. Um, I mean, you, you're right that um, the fungi is probably the most challenging of the, of the major groups um, because there are so many um, features that really help to identify. As you'll know, often it's, it's smell, uh, yeah. sometimes taste, what yeah. happens if you bruise it. Uh, none of those um, are easily put across in terms of a, a photo. But you can always add them as comments. Yeah. Um, and also there's so many species that, and so many similar ones, it's, it can be very challenging. Yeah. Um, so in terms of can you put them in at a higher taxonomic level, um, you can to some degree, but not probably as high a taxonomic level as you suggested, like, uh, you know, uh, just an yeah. Yeah. Where, where there is a small group of, of species, this doesn't just apply to fungi but to many of the groups yeah um, that we know are really hard to tell apart will often create an aggregate for them okay um, so you can submit it as an aggregate in other cases um, and this is true of many plants for example we have put the just the genus down and so you could record it at genus level I have to say recording it at a higher level than that doesn't okay. actually add much value because it could be anything really. Yeah, and sure. So we don't bother. Okay. Um, so the other thing I didn't mention in my presentation, but you just hinted at, which is a good point, which I just like to reiterate, is if you have something that you don't know what it is, you can submit it with a photo um, as an un an unknown species. Yeah. Um, you don't have to pick uh, a known species from the list. Okay, um, great. Um, we prefer it, to be honest, just because it makes our life a little easier if you can try your best beforehand 
yeah. to get somebody else to identify it. As you imagine, there's an awful lot of, of records flowing through the system. Yeah. But we will try our best uh, okay. to, to identify it for you. OK, so um, so if you put it down as unknown, um, can I can you still add photos with that? Yes. If well, there's can. no point putting it down as unknown unless you do put a no. photo with it. Um, okay. So yeah. um, the other thing you mentioned, which, uh, again, I, I, I didn't explain, um, no. you actually have two options for entering something where you haven't got a species name. One mm -hmm. is the unknown species, which we just talked about. But the other one is new species. And this is um, where you think you found something that isn't on the menu already. You, you, you suggested you've come across that. That may well be true. Um, uh, we've got 7,000 species on our list at the moment. And there, but there are an estimated maybe 20,000 species that ultimately could be found in Leicester and Rutland. Mm. So you may have found one of those others. Uh, yeah. So we only put species on our list when we've got a known record for it. And mm. so in that case, you would use the new species entry and it would then prompt you to, uh, to tell us what you think it is. Okay. Add some pictures, we might then want to contact you just to check it and so on. And then we will add it to the system. Okay, and, and also, because um, uh, name changes as well. So the name changes. So how do you, if you've got an old, I don't know, <laughs> field guide and you think it's you know uh, mushrooms are notorious you know well everything isn't it yeah. same. so how do you cope with that on nature spot okay um the menu that um or where you type in the species and it brings up that drop down menu has yeah. uh, multiple entries for every species um so it it has uh, both the common name and the latin name if there are older Latin names, yeah. um, then it will also include those. Well, okay. Um, and if there are different spellings of the common name, we'll also try and put those down. I mean, that's okay. not to say that we've ticked every possible box. Yeah. But um, if you can't find it, the other way is just to drop us a quick note and say, well, I, I'm trying to record X, Y, and Z. Can't find it. Is it there or is it a new species? And we can just then give you some pointers. Uh -huh. But you'll probably find that in most cases it, it will appear maybe under its old name or under its common name. OK, that's great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great. Good. OK, brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, I've not got anything else in the chat. Has anybody else who's still with us um, got any questions? I'm aware we've run over a little bit on time today. Uh, I'm not I'm not seeing anything. Um, so I think probably I will call us to a close a few minutes over time, but um, with the technical glitch in the middle, which yes. um, thank you for sticking with us. Uh, and yeah, as, as Dave said, these things happen when you're when you're working on Zoom. So um, hopefully uh, that little hiatus didn't cause too much trouble. Um, but just say thank you very much again, um, Dave. Thanks for your time. My pleasure. Um, and I think just reiterate if you've got questions, myself, Dave drop us an email give us a call our details are either on the nature spot side site or you've got my web uh, my email address and um, so do get in touch with any questions uh, and we will do our best to help you out there um, look out for the next session and um, the booking link will be coming around quite soon so have a look out for that uh, and then for future emails about what's coming up um, over the next year and um, we've got some as i said hopefully plans to get outside and get together uh, and go out and, and be in the field looking for some species so Thanks very much, everybody. I will uh, finish the meeting. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.